welcome to the Madden America podcast, your source for science, psychiatry and social justice. Hello, this is James and welcome to the Madden America podcast. This week, my guest is Dr. Gordon Warm. Dr. Warm is a medical doctor specializing in psychiatry. He trained with Carl Menninger at the Menninger Clinic in the US and at Heidelberg University in Germany and has been an academic at the University of Toronto for 40 years. Dr. Warm has written five books, Reluctant Treasures in 1994, The Psychotherapist in 1996, The Cure of Folly in 2003, and Daggers of the Mind, Psychiatry and the Myth of Mental Disease in 2006. His most recent book, published in 2016, is Brain Evangelists, How Psychiatry Has Convinced Us to Believe in Its Far-Fetched Science and Dubious Treatments, in which he blows the whistle on modern psychiatry, arguing that in the long history of medicine, biological and chemical abnormalities in psychiatric patients have never been identified, and labels such as schizophrenia and depression are misleading metaphors that dehumanise patients. Welcome, Dr. Warm. Thank you so much for talking with me for the podcast. Firstly, for the listeners, I just wondered if you could tell us a little bit about your background and what led you into psychiatry. Well, I think I have a very ordinary background. It's very common in Canada for people to be immigrants or the children of immigrants. My parents were immigrants, and I grew up uh, in, uh, in Toronto, in Canada, and had a standard education. I think I was perhaps a little, I think inside myself I was a little bit odd, but I don't think on the outside I looked odd. I had a happy childhood, I played, I had fun, but I was always interested in literature a little more than boys were supposed to be. Boys were supposed to be rough and tumble, and I did rough and tumble, but secretly I was much more interested in things like literature and philosophy. And uh, when I went to medical school, because of that, although I'm sure my mother thinks I went to medical school because she told me to. I liked being a doctor, a general doctor. In fact, I spent some time in England. I spent a year in England, in London, where I did surgery and internal medicine. But I always intended to come back to Canada and become a psychiatrist. The literature, and I still read philosophy. So what was it about psychiatry that appealed to you more than perhaps functional medicine? Well, I, I remember our teachers, they were very biologically oriented in medical school, and they taught us oh, all these discoveries that were being made. Even here in Toronto, we were discovering wonderful things about the abnormal biology. But there always would be one or two psychiatrists around who would talk about that people had reasons for why, patients had reasons for why they did what they did. And they are the ones that caught my interest. I never forgot them. And then, of course, I went to the United States to train. I trained in a place with a very strong psychoanalytic orientation. And uh, psychoanalysis, of course, was very dominant in American psychiatry at that time. The president of every psychiatric organization was a psychoanalyst. The chairman of every department of psychiatry was a psychoanalyst. And I was a very ardent psychoanalytic psychiatrist, too. I don't think I've given that up completely. I'm still, I'm still impressed by some of the things that Freud said. But Freud made lots of mistakes. Freud wanted psychiatry to be scientific, and that led him astray. So I try to avoid those things that I think he didn't understand as well as I wished he would have. Thank you. And I just wanted to ask a little bit about your most recent book, Brain Evangelists, which I think was released in 2016. After reading it, I came away with the impression that you felt that psychiatry perhaps has more in common with anthropology than biology. And I wondered if that was a fair observation. And if so, what led you to that view? Well, another way of coming at the same point you're making is to talk about how intensely social human beings are. Their whole lives are captured by the wish to be social, to fit into our society. And I suppose that's an anthropological thing or a sociological thing, but I think it's a psychiatric thing too. If you think about our patients, well, if you think about human beings in general, we're, we identify with our culture, with the, our ancestry. We identify with the fashions that we're surrounded by. We are influenced more than influenced. We're captured by uh, the language culture we live in, and 
what my colleagues don't want to acknowledge is that when we have a psychiatric disorder, we are identifying with a part of our culture. Uh, the most obvious example is hysteria. A hundred years ago and a little over a hundred years ago, actually still in my era, we saw patients that are called hysterical, the same patients that uh, Freud saw, usually women, women with paralyses and uh, and psychological blindness and areas of anesthetic on their, in their body, convulsions. Nobody could ever find anything wrong with them. Now, those patients have dis disappeared, which is a good example of how culture-bound psychiatric problems are. These people who used to be called hysterics are still around, but they have different complaints now. They don't complain about uh, the things I mentioned a moment ago. The commonest is pain. A lot of patients come to doctors. They don't come to psychiatrists. They come to family doctors. They go to neurologists and complain of pain. And I'm sorry to say that a lot of these patients are given narcotic drugs for their pains, for which no one has ever found a cause. Uh, it's the very same as with the traditional histrionic patients. The word hysteria has a slightly insulting quality to it. Doctors are too prudent to ever say this out loud, but secretly doctors think, God, what a ridiculous woman this is with her hysteria and her, well, she's not faking, but, you know, she's kind of nuts, you know, there's nothing wrong with her. They don't talk that way about men. However, uh, there are analogous things about men. But it's interesting to me that when women have these kinds of odd problems, it's called disease. The problem that men have is that they're sort of hyper-masculine. They're all full of hairiness and vulgarity and boisterousness and nastiness and bragging. But that doesn't come to the attention of doctors or psychiatrists. It's considered a moral problem. So when women have these kinds of psychological problems of exaggerated sexuality, and I think hysteria can be called an exaggerated form of female sexual behaviors, uh, it's treated as a disease. If men do it, strutting around, bragging, telling about all their conquests, it's considered a fault of flaw. So hospitals are overstuffed with hysterical ladies. Jails are overstuffed with, I could call them histrionic men, but I call them, I usually call them bully boy men. So all this is very culture bound. That's why this is part of the answer to your question. These behaviors are culture bound. Uh, young boys from a very early age are already behaving in this hyper masculine way. I was at a baseball game yesterday and there were little boys seven, eight years old, they already were uh, wanting to be hyper-masculine and naughty, be bad boys. I must say the little girls all wanted to be baseball players at the game, too. But when somebody wanted to take their picture, they acted in very feminine ways. They knew how to hold their bodies. They knew how to smile. And these things are learned from a culture. Now, I say that rather absolutely, that it's learned from a culture could be biological. I don't know. I don't. Nobody knows. There's no way to distinguish uh, the degree to which masculine behavior is genetic or the degree to which it's environmental or cultural. And we just have to say we don't know. We are complex creatures, aren't we? And I just wondered how you felt psychiatry should respond to that complexity. I think the best psychiatric response is not to get too excited about cultural differences. With our patients, we're very quick to say this, that, or the other thing is pathology, and you have to do something about it, and you have to uh, see a therapist, or you have to have a pill. And I'm not so sure that we all need to be exactly like one another. However, that leaves out the fact that there are very extreme types of behavior that are very hard to tolerate. Rape, for example, criminality. Uh, I don't mean we have to tolerate these behaviors like that, but I don't like the idea 
of making rape into a medical problem. This fellow, he has psychiatric problems. And, uh, you know, you raise your eyebrows when I mention Trump. And I think being too tolerant, being, you know, you hear the word empathy all the time. Well, it's a very important idea, but empathy has sort of become confused with a kindness, a universal kindness. All people have to be treated with kindness. But if you ask me to have kind thoughts about a pedophile, you're going to have a lot of trouble convincing me that I should feel, uh, I can understand using empathy, I can understand what he may be feeling, what his longings are, what his to me, distasteful sexual longings are, and I don't sympathize with them, and I don't feel sorry for them, and I'm very concerned that he might convince me that he's never going to do it again, and that I might be overwhelmed by a kindness that's, that's unhelpful, because most of these guys do it again. You know, it's very hard to change your sexual interests. You know, if you ask me to stop being heterosexual, good luck to you. <laughs> you have to kill me before it. You know, sexual orientation is very important, very powerful, and pedophiles don't change their sexual orientation. Although I read in the paper all the time that they do, but they don't. And anyway, this, this kindness creates reactionary people like Donald Trump. And I think we've gone a little bit overboard in our kindness reaction. Uh, you know, if somebody says stupid things or has a crazy delusion and pesters me about the crazy delusion, there's no harm in saying, cut it out, quit talking to me, quit telling me all this nonsense. This is ridiculous. I'm not going to convince him if he's got a delusion. He's going to keep on believing it. But at least I can say, this is distasteful. I certainly am not going to say, oh, I see, tell me more about, uh, oh, you really believe the people, oh, that must be very upsetting for you. I don't say things like that. I think we should take a stand against behavior that is damaging for the patient, that I don't like, that our culture, our culture doesn't like. Thank you. And there is also quite a thread in Brain Evangelists about the biological approach to psychological distress, and if that's the approach we should be taking. I just wanted to ask for your view on why psychiatry has followed this biomedical model, and is that something that we should challenge? I, I'm sure I said somewhere in the book that we don't know as much about why people do things as we think we do. And I don't think we know why the medical, the biomedical model is so popular uh, when we approach psychiatric patients. It's been going on since the day of cavemen. As you probably know, there's evidence that they were already boring holes in, in people's skulls in caveman days. So that, that biological model has been around for a long, long time. Uh, there are other models that, that people have used. There's the religious model. And uh, you can still go to uh, an Anglican priest and have yourself purified and have these devils driven out of you or a Catholic priest, I don't know about other religions, but I know in Africa they very often use that kind of exorcism as a way of curing psychiatric illnesses. Now, that's not the biological model. The biological model uh, has become stronger, I think, because we in the West, it's a result of the Enlightenment, where we believed there were uh, concrete reasons for everything that happens in the world. We had to find causes for things, not spiritual causes, not religious causes, not devilish causes, physical causes. And I think it's, I don't know if it's a, I hope it's a hangover uh, from the Enlightenment, but I fear that it's more than that. I fear that it's kind of a, a massive uh, superstition, a cultural superstition, and I think it's very harmful to our patients. I think it's what we do, and I'm sure you and I do it too without even knowing that we do it. We cast our patients, psychiatric patients, into a role inferior to us. They aren't up to our standard, and 
probably it's something in their genes, probably there's an abnormal chemical somewhere. If you've read my book, you know that I make the analogy to the way we treated Jews for so many years, the way we've treated women, the way we've treated homosexuality, and uh, there are more examples than that. Somehow, anybody that is different, everybody that isn't a nice white Protestant like me or Christian Protestant like me, is just one shade lower than me or many shades lower than me. They aren't up to my standard. And so we've got to go into Africa and we've got to make everybody like us and psychiatrists at my university and all of the universities in the Western world. We send psychiatrists to all these countries trying to persuade them to use these drugs, and they do. We spend millions of dollars sending psychiatrists to these countries to teach them to follow our model, because they aren't as smart as we are. They haven't figured out these things the way we have. I think uh, the first thing I said about this is very important. I said, you've probably got this in you too, and I for sure have got this in me, this immediate tendency to find somebody else's ways inferior to mine. I don't know what we do about that. It's so automatic. We preach. We do a lot of preaching. Stop being racist. You've got to stop being prejudiced. We've got, well, I think that's good to try to teach people or persuade people or urge people to not do this kind of thing. But I have a feeling that a lot of our prejudice gets, is hidden. It's still in us. And that's what I mean when I say, I think it's in all of us. And I don't know what to do about it, except to have conversations like this. I think conversations like this are worthwhile. I think they are. And if I relate that to my own experience, I wonder if I was part of the problem. Because when I saw my own psychiatrist, I put them on a pedestal. Before I even got into their office, I saw them as someone that was much smarter than me and who understood the human condition. And I probably behaved in their office as an inferior because that's how I felt. I think that's a very important point you just made. I agree with you completely. I think we, we all did that with our psychiatrist. And I know my patients do. I'm a hero to my patients. I'm surprised I haven't had a phone call from Sweden yet telling me I'm going to get the Nobel Prize. Or what a fine psychiatrist I am. I hear they phone in the middle of the night. <laughs> and Dr. Warm, moving on to talk about how a psychiatrist should help their patients, I was wondering what your view is of the skills that psychiatrists should be developing. Watching, describing, and talking. And it's the kind of conversation we're having. I mean, I know I get to talk a lot more than you in this conversation, and, and I don't mean it quite that way, but seriously trying to like that little incident in Cambodia, I, I was upset about it for several days. And I think probably it's a good thing I was upset because I it kind of I intellectually knew that I had these tendencies in me, just the way I'm complaining about my psychiatric colleagues' tendencies to devalue patients. But until I felt myself being insulting or another human being. And that dismissive gesture, it haunted me for several days. So I think thinking about things like that, talking about those things, noticing those things in myself, in yourself. Uh, I try to talk to my patients in this way. There are uh, some things I don't do. I don't give my patients advice, never. Never, never, never. The reason is that advice is cheap. I give myself advice all the time. If I sit on the subway train and say to the man beside me, you know, I've got this trouble and that trouble, he'll give me advice. I know he will. Anybody can give advice. Advice is part of being a decent human being. And the question you ask me is, is there something a therapist or a psychiatrist can do that's a little more than just being a decent human being. And I think our conversation is a little bit more. Not a lot more. I'm not going to transform my patients. But they may think twice about some things, some of their attitudes, some of their behaviors. 
but you've got to watch your, your doctors have to should watch their patients. There's a cartoon around. You probably saw it on on Facebook or wherever it was. The man says, "Oh, I've been so depressed ever since my my daughter moved out of our home." And the psychiatrist says, "And uh, has there been any blood in your urine recently?" <laughs> like it just he's got a list, and he hasn't listened to his patient listening. And listening is much more fun, too, than using a list. People are interesting. I was just going to say that having interviewed you and a few other psychiatrists that are willing to question their own profession, and having compared that experience to psychiatrists that I've consulted with as a patient previously, there are many differences in approach, of course, but what I find notable is the humility to accept that we're all learning each and every day, and that seems quite important. Well, you know, there are some things we know. We know that If a man's sister dies, he's going to be upset. Now, that's an incontrovertible psychological piece of knowledge, piece of psychological knowledge. It isn't universal, by the way, but still, it's pretty solid. But most other things, we don't know why people do things. We really don't know. When our patients come in, we don't know why they're anxious, depressed, worried, having crazy thought, whatever it is that they they complain about. And boy, does that ever take humility. Because getting back to culture, the culture has explanations ready at hand for us. And it's very easy to latch on to common cultural explanations that are only cultural, that they have nothing to do with what's really going on. Like, you had a bad mother or... If, the, if his parents hadn't been so overprotective, then he would have. You know, I'm sure these things happen. We don't know when they happen and when they apply to this patient or to that patient. Culture has ways to talk about these. And when you go and see a therapist, you know, there are very common things to say. Uh, you've got to stand up for yourself more. Uh, when you're feeling angry, you've got to let your anger out and sh- let people see how you're feeling. I don't think those things do any good. I think those are just currently popular. hundred years ago, you would have been told to go and talk to your priest or to pray more or whatever they might have said. Culture, the culture, we're very much in the grips of our culture, all of us. And Dr. Warm, I just wondered how you approach managing the expectations of your patients, because... People like me often have an expectation that they're going to be fixed. There's going to be a diagnosis and then a procedure or a drug. But the world that you're describing is much less certain than that. And I think that's important to recognize. So how do you manage that uncertainty? Because there aren't fixes for many of these issues. What I always hoped for in my first interview with someone, and it nearly always happens. Now, I've been around a long time, so I'm very experienced. So I'm good at doing this kind of thing. But, you know, I always ask a little bit about their mother and their father and their brothers and their sisters and so on and so forth. And about 20 minutes into the interview, I'm liable to say to the patient, so you've done a lot better than your brothers and sisters, and you've actually done better in your life than your father did too. And that catches their interest. It's never crossed their mind. Or another thing might be someone who comes from a, working class family who has an interest in the arts, an interest in, in ballet, in classical music, and in high literature, and so on. And I might say to them 20 minutes into the interview, some people think it's a sin to be too sophisticated, to be too interested in artistic things. It gets them thinking, and that's all I care about. And I get this person to think more about himself or herself. And there are funny little things that in ordinary conversation we don't notice. We say, oh, so you're interested in cultural things. I am too. Yeah, I really like going to the symphony. And we just chatter about it. But I turn it. I don't chatter. I say, I notice that you're different from other people in your family in this respect. And I, that usually gets people thinking. That's important too, isn't it? That self-awareness and willingness to engage in their own experiences. A, a very small number of patients really don't like it. When, they, when you say something like that, 
they they're a little bit repelled. So then I try to I try to slow down, slow down, slow down. But sometimes I lose the patient because of that. Now it's not often, quite frankly. Partly that's because I'm you know, I've got the gift of the gab by now and I know how to how to circumvent difficulties when I'm having a conversation. But some patients they don't want that. They they want something a little more if I say a cusk more cultish, that's kind of a nasty word, cultish. They want to belong to a movement, a group of people who are excited about something together. And they don't want my very singular focus on you, you, you. They want to be part of a movement. And so they'll find another kind of psychiatrist or another kind of therapist, somebody different from me. And some people, they really believe they have something biologically wrong with them. Thank you. That's really interesting. And I wanted to move on now to ask for your views on psychiatric medication. The drugs used in psychiatry do seem to be a major plank of the therapeutic response to psychological or emotional distress. And I think Canada per capita now has the fourth highest use of psychiatric drugs behind the US, Iceland and Australia. And I just wanted to ask for your reflections on the use of psychiatric drugs and how you see their place as an intervention. First of all, I'll confess that in my medicine cabinet, I do have some lorazepam tablets. And I occasionally take a little nibble of one of those drugs. I, I don't take a whole pill, I never will. And I don't do it very often. I'm very terrified of becoming addicted. And these drugs, the Valium type drugs, are they really work. They're very good for anxiety. I guess they're very good for sleep too. But they're so addicting. They're very quickly addicting. And once you're addicted to them, they don't work anymore. I'm not a big I haven't prescribed Valium for anybody for 20 years. I haven't prescribed any drugs for any patients for many, many years. Because when patients ask me for drugs, and patients do ask for drugs, I try to treat that as part of our conversation. So you're a man that feels that it's very important that I be kind of a magical doctor who has a magical drug will make your nervousness go away. So this is something maybe we can think about, about you, that that's part of your psychology, that you would hope and hope and hope that I would have this product, this substance, this elixir. And in having such an interest, you're, you're a well-known character. I mean, you've read the Bible. You've read novels. You probably have a drink of whiskey now and then, the way I do. The idea that there is some magic elixir that is going to make us better is very common. And that's what the question is that you're asking me. You're asking me if, if I will participate in this very entrenched cultural belief system. Not necessarily bad, but that's what you'd like to get going here in our conversation. Now, you see, I've evaded the question. I haven't really answered his direction, his question directly, but I've put a lot of blocks in his way. I've tried to obstruct him from having a comeback. I've given, I've got all of this armor around it so that he's stuck where if he says, yeah, but I still want some Valium, he's being kind of silly or crabby or obstructionistic. Some people do. Well, if they do, if they persist, then I say, I'm not much of a drug giver. I'm very nervous about all these drugs. The Valium one, you know, you get addicted to it. And some of these other ones have terrible side effects. They make you feel awful. That's not the most important thing. They do damage to your body. I've been dreaming of just that. So I'll give them a definite no if they won't play the psychological game with me. I don't, I don't prescribe drugs anymore. And the ones that, the antipsychotic drugs, and that word antipsychotic was introduced by the drug companies because that isn't, when they came on the market, that isn't what they were called. They were called neuroleptics. And uh, those drugs do terrible damage, shorten your life. If they're given in moderate doses, I, I, I hear just terrible figures about 
the redu uh, reduction in life expectancy with these drugs is just terrible. Uh, you mentioned Whitaker on another occasion, and he I think he's, he's sort of documented a lot of that. Just terrible. And, I mean, that isn't even the thing that bothers me the most. What bothers me the most is it turns these people into zombies. I don't know if you've walked around uh, the lobby of a mental hospital and seen these people walking around like zombies. It just horrifies me. And, of course, the, the rationale is, is often that there's no use talking to these patients because they can't really comprehend. But, you know, if you watch these patients in the lobby of the psychiatric hospital, you'll see that they're, for example, very skilled at bumming cigarettes. They're very good at going out on the sidewalk and bumming a cigarette from somebody. Outside of my hospital, there's a very complicated traffic uh, intersection with many complicated li lights. They don't have any trouble with that. They can figure it out just like that. So this pathology in their thinking has a social purpose because when something suits their social purpose, getting across the street, bombing a cigarette, they're very skilled at doing it. But when you talk to them and they say, uh, the boogeyman is coming to get me, they're trying to get a certain reaction from me because their logic isn't abnormal. It's that their logic isn't used for certain kinds of social interaction. Well, I have spoken with people who've said that they felt chemically isolated from all emotion and feelings, not necessarily just the troubling or disturbing ones. Well, it's just awful. It's horrible. By the way, you probably know the study. Uh, some couple of clever Americans uh, did a study uh, many years ago, 40 years ago. Nobody pays attention to these studies. Uh, they were, I think they were uh, anthropologists or sociologists, and uh, they each went to a psychiatrist and said, described a delusion. I, there's somebody doing this and this and this. And both of them were put into the hospital, the local hospital, and they were on the same ward. And the experiment was that you only tell the psychiatrist one abnormal symptom, and once they put you in the hospital, you never mention it again. You just act in your ordinary way. And uh, they couldn't get out of the hospital. They couldn't. They were in there for, I don't know, weeks, maybe months, until, you know, a colleague came around and told that they had duped the hospital into hospitalizing. Because there is no way of discovering a disease in psychiatric patients. So there is no test. There is no uh, finding available to say the patient has a disease or doesn't have a disease, but they had a diagnosis, which is very different from having a disease yeah. diagnosed, of course, with schizophrenia. And the diagnosis could, in some circumstances, become constraining or maybe even limit future options. I was, I was, I'm in the business, and I think I was probably at least as old as you before I woke up and realized that it was all a lot of fooey. Now, I must admit, in the back of my mind, I was always a little puzzled by it all, what I was seeing going on. But you know how we are. I said, yeah, but you know, a lot of experienced people have been doing this. It's the way the system works. And, you know, we're trying to do our best. And a million excuses come to mind. The fact that we're damaging people's lives, taking away their civil rights. We don't take away the civil rights of rapists, murderers, and pedophiles, they are allowed to have a lawyer and they have to be properly charged and blah, blah, blah. But if it's a psychiatric patient, right here in my drawer, I can open my, well, if you step into the province of Ontario, I can take that piece of paper out and have you locked up within a couple of hours. Just like that, just on my word. That's frighteningly powerful, isn't it? It's it's horrifying. And Dr. Warm, as we come to the close, I just wondered what your thoughts were on where psychiatry is heading as a profession. Well, I think it's heading in a straight line and not going to do anything different unless some intervention can be made in their system. And I, I worry about this. I'm not sure what the best way is. 
I always thought the best way is to go over the heads of the profession and appeal to the public at large. And I've written books with the idea the public will read these things and then they will know and blah, blah, blah. It doesn't do any good. So somebody, now these hospitals and institutions are funded by governments. You know, every once in a while there's a politician who is a bit of a crusader. Maybe, I mean, I've never had this thought before, that word crusader. To find some crusaders in the various Western governments that will shame the other parliamentarians. And, you know, there are millions and millions and millions of dollars spent. In my hospital alone doing research on what? On nothing. There's no abnormal finding to do research on. But I don't know what they're doing in their labs, but this is the kind of thing they do. I was on sabbatical in Israel, and of course, one of the purposes of Israel is to make international connections so that you can get promoted and become a full professor. <laughs> That's very cynical. But anyway, so some fellow, I'd never met him, I didn't know who he was, but he was trying to make contact with me so he could use my name as a reference. He said, would you like to come to my lab? So I went to his lab, and he was going to show me an animal model of depression. An animal model of depression is to put a mouse in a pail of water and leave it there overnight. That's his model of depression. This is a serious senior researcher in an advanced Western university. So... Crusaders are better at this fight than you and I are, I think. I think journalists are important. Journalists, but not all of them. If you read, I don't know about your newspapers, but when I read the major Canadian newspaper, the Globe and Mail, the Toronto Globe and Mail, which I read every day, there are constant articles. Be sure you're looking after the mental health of this, of this, of this. Be sure to consult your psychiatrist if this. I mean, it's a Dark is almost doing nonsense. They're, they're sort of cheerleading articles. You know, you'll do better. Uh, we'll, you know, we want to prevent suicide. The horrible thing about suicide is that the people who actually commit suicide tend to behave normally because they've made up their mind that they're going to do it already. So all this stuff about Oh, you know, if you if somebody is doing this, or they're not eating properly, or they're not sleeping properly, or if they're wringing their hands all the time, you know, well, they do sometimes commit suicide, of course. But much more common is that the person who commits suicide has been acting normally. I was taught that if you have a depressed patient, and all of a sudden he's doing better, watch out, may have decided to kill himself. No any good crusaders. But I think I, I've been in the hands of some. They were looking for problems to fix. But I was too dumb to realize that that they maybe were the ones that could do something. So I leave it to you young guys to just take care of this problem, finding crusaders. <laughs> well, young is all relative. I certainly don't feel very young. But Dr. Warm, thank you for being part of the podcast and for helping me understand that not every psychiatrist believes the same thing. And I'm grateful that there are people who will share views that don't align with the mainstream. Well, but maybe your congratulations are too soon. Maybe I didn't do that until I was near the end of my career and I didn't care anymore. Because I already had my pieces of paper on the wall and uh, I felt safe. Nobody could really harm me anymore. It's true, you know. But you could have chosen not to write your books, and of the many people reading, they're not all going to be psychiatrists or ex-patients. Many are going to be the interested general public. And that's what I liked about Brain Evangelists, was that it isn't a medical textbook, it isn't a technical thing. It's about the relationships and interactions between people, and maybe that's how we should be making sense of individual experiences, not through brain scans or understanding neurotransmitters, but... The kind of thing that happens every day when someone bumps into a friend on the street. That social back and forth. Right. Yesterday at the baseball game, I don't go to baseball games. Somebody gave me a ticket. I wanted to go. 
And it's a very different experience. People don't even watch the baseball game. They're so busy having fun. And there was a woman in front of me eating a hot dog. It was that long. Tapped her on the shoulder and I said, I have placed a bet that you cannot eat that whole thing. Now, you see, that's what you're talking about. That that's what matters is these little moments between two human beings. She laughed and, and then that precipitated banter throughout the whole ball game. She would turn around and make remarks and I would make remarks. And uh, it was Mother's Day in North America. And so she was, she was, she was actually the grandmother and she was surrounded by her children and grandchildren. But she recognized that she and I were of the same age. So she paid attention to me too. That little moment between you was probably far more effective for your mental health than any antidepressant. That's right. It keeps keeps me going in my life, are those little moments. Dr. Warm, thank you so much for your time today. It was such an interesting discussion. Oh, it's my pleasure. I enjoyed talking to you. I'm so grateful to Dr. Warm for giving up his time to chat with me for the podcast. So thank you so much for listening today. Please tell your friends and family about the podcast. And if you're listening in iTunes, please leave us a review as we want to get more people listening too. So until next time, take care. Thank you for listening to the Madden America podcast. Visit maddenamerica.com for more news, views and updates.